So good afternoon, everybody, and welcome. Uh, today's event is entitled Augustine's Theology of Creation, Nature, Knowledge, Stewardship. Our presenter today is Dr. Matthew Knotts. Matthew Knotts teaches theology at Loyola Academy in Wilmette, Illinois. He holds a PhD in theology from the University of Leuven in Belgium and a master's in philosophy from the University of St. Andrews in the UK. While completing his doctoral studies, he performed research stays at the University of Chicago Divinity School and in the Melbourne at the Institute for Religion and Critical Inquiry of the Australian Catholic University. His first book on creation, science, disenchantment, and the contours of being and knowing was published in 2020 by Bloomsbury Academic in the Reading Augustine series. On the basis of an historical analysis of Augustine and a hermeneutical engagement with sources in contemporary philo philosophy and theology, it argues for an understanding of the world as not merely a collection of facts to be cataloged, but a repository of truths to be discovered and discerned. He is currently working on his second book for the same series, which considers the abyssal nature and dialectical constitution of the human person according to Augustine. His scholarship has appeared in the Augustinus Lexicon, Philosophy and Theology, and Studia Patristica, among others. Welcome, Dr. Knott, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Dr. Irizar, for this warm welcome. Thank you for this opportunity to speak. Thank you to Professor Hannon uh, for joining, and thank you to the uh, audience as well for being with us. Uh, I think this is very copacetic. I've had the opportunity to work with uh, both uh, Dr. Irizar and Professor Hannon uh, in the past. Very grateful to be working with them again, and hopefully uh, this will lead to uh, further fruitful scholarly and academic discussions. This presentation will be drawn from my book, which Dr. Irizar mentioned in the reading Augustine series. I might note as well that Dr. Irizar has his own book appearing in this series early next year. Professor Hannon has a book in this series as well, among others. Uh, I encourage you to look at those as well. The book itself consists of six major chapters. And in this talk, I'm going to be focusing on two of them. So the talk itself consists of three major parts. In the first, I look at Augustine's theology of creation in order to address how we think about nature in a contemporary theological setting. What is Augustine's theology of creation? What is its significance? The second part deals with knowledge, and this will draw from the fifth chapter. So in order to think about creation for Augustine means that the world is constituted in a certain way, that we ourselves are made and constituted in a certain way. And so in order to think about human knowledge, we have to think about the more fundamental question of what it means to be created. And in the third and final part of this talk, I'm going to take a bit of a departure from my main area of research, and I'm going to be looking at contemporary eco-theology, and in particular, Pope Francis' recent Laudato Si, and I'll be talking about ways in which Augustine's understanding of nature and knowledge can inform contemporary responses to the ecological crisis, in particular in terms of the stewardship model of creation, which Francis discusses in Laudato Si. In this first part, I'm going to say a few things very briefly about Augustine's theology of creation and how that shapes his understanding of nature. One way of raising this question is, let's say, a kind of indirect route. So as you may be familiar, there's the uh, medieval um, treatise, uh, Cor Deus Homo, Why Does God Become Man? For patristics like Augustine, but in particular Athanasius, there's the question which is a little different, Cor Filius Homo, Why Does the Son Become Man? It's not immediately obvious why the Son, as opposed to the Father or the Holy Spirit, would become incarnate. So the way that Athanasius answers this question, the way that I think Augustine answers this question, is linked with a theology of creation. So the agent of creation is the Son. The Son, the Word of God, is always dynamically interacting with reality from the very beginning of the world. 
And furthermore, and I think this is especially crucial for people like Augustine, the accounts of creation in Genesis 1 are essentially the same as the Johannine prologue. So they're approached from different perspectives, but they're both ways of talking about the word being the agent of creation, the uh, main person of the Trinity through whom God creates and institutes the world. So the Son is the word of God. In Genesis, we have the word imposing order on chaos. In John, of course, we have the notion that the word is God from the very beginning um, and that all things came to be through the word. And then after creation falls, the word enters reality in a very particular way. So initially, for people like Augustine, it's crucial that we have this identification of son and word. And with other biblical passages, then there's the ability or the opportunity to identify the son and the word with other aspects of God, and in particular, wisdom. So this is present in Paul, the idea that Christ is the wisdom and the power of God. And so what Augustine does is link this with, for instance, the Old Testament or Hebrew Bible book of wisdom. And this allows Augustine to speak about creation, not simply in, in terms of, the, uh, of, of things being produced, that's important, of course, but the idea that the world is organized in a certain way, that it reflects the uh, divine wisdom. Uh, of course, the Book of Wisdom speaks um, uh, of God putting things together according to weight, number, and measure. This is one of Augustine's favorite passages, and we'll say more about this in due course, the way in which a uh, created reality reflects the divine mind. What's also crucial is that Augustine distinguishes between two distinct senses of creation. So on the one hand, all things are given to be at a particular time. So for instance, in the fifth book of De Genesi Ad Literam, one of Augustine's commentaries on Genesis, there's the idea that all things are created together at a particular point in time. However, there is also the understanding that God continues to act in and through creation, that creation is this ongoing process. God is continuing to guide the world and lead it to fulfillment. So both of these uh, senses of creation are crucial and fundamental for Augustine. And we're going to see throughout the course of this talk how, um, how that's significant for theology and philosophy. And I think also significant uh, for how we think about the environment in a contemporary setting. Wisdom is infused into, into the created order. It reflects the divine mind. But we have to say something here as, as a caveat, and, and I won't dwell too long on this, but I, I think it's worth mentioning. This is not to say that God is a watchmaker, like Paley would have said. This is not to say that God is a demiurge in the uh, at least apparently literal platonic sense of the term. This is not to say that God tinkers with the universe or creates plans and then executes them. For Augustine, and I think we see this in neoplatonic sources like Plotinus, the idea is that in speaking, in uttering the word, the world is coming to be, that nature itself is an expression of the divine mind. It's not um, uh, accidental, it's not de facto, that the world itself um, gives us a sense of what God is like, what the inner life of the Trinity really is. And finally, what's crucial for Augustine, especially in terms of knowledge, is the place that human beings occupy within this entire economy. So, of course, Genesis talks about uh, the world being created, but in particular, human beings being created in the image of God. And, of course, uh, Dr. Irizar here is the is the expert on the Imago Dei in Augustine, so I uh, defer to him in these matters, but I'll simply note for now uh, that Augustine sees this as crucial for rational agents, that we have as human beings a very special place in reality, that we can discern the vestiges of God within creation. We are connected uh, with the divine in a certain way. And this, I think, is the crucial link that leads us from Augustine's theology of creation or his understanding of nature and the natural world to a discussion of knowledge. Now, according to Augustine, there's this idea that if divine wisdom creates the world, if order is infused into reality from a divine perspective and we are able to perceive it, that means that we can somehow think of the world as communicative, that it speaks of God, that it it reveals God in a certain way, especially in the sense of 
creatio continua, in other words, an ongoing creative process. So that leads us to the following question, and I, I raise this uh, in my book as well. What does it mean? What could it mean to engage in dialogue with nature? This might seem a little strange, and, and I think that this is an area where especially contemporary theology and philosophy might need to wrestle, as it were. Just to give you one example of where we might go wrong, um, it's a little um, indirect and humorous perhaps, but there's the story of George III, uh, who, uh, as you may know, suffered from bouts of madness. And there's the story of one day he's in his carriage and he alights and he runs over uh, to a tree and starts having this very vigorous uh, argument. And his courtiers panic, they're horrified. Uh, they rush him back into the carriage and get him away. This is a sign that he, he has really deteriorated uh, in terms of his mental state. So obviously we don't mean that when we're saying, do we, do we talk with nature? We're, we're not um, uh, engaged in, in this, this kind of uh, extreme uh, form of, of mental illness. But, so what does that mean? So in order to think about that, I'm going to put it back on you for a moment. So what does it mean to talk with nature, to reflect on creation as communicating with us? Think of times that you yourself have had a spiritual experience in the natural world. Where were you? What were you doing? How did it feel? Take just a brief moment, maybe 30 seconds to a minute. Think about this question, reflect on it, and try to get an image or a feeling and hold it in your mind. And we'll proceed after that in just a brief moment. Hopefully you have thought of something, you've recalled an experience, something in which God somehow speaks to you or connects with you in the midst of the natural world. I'd, I'd encourage you to think about that, especially for um, th this next part of, of the talk and, and see if any of what Augustine has to say resonates with you or connects with your experience. For me, something that's really important uh, or meaningful is the way in which outer space uh, speaks to, as it were, the glory of God. So there's the psalm according to which the heavens declare the glory of God. And of course, we at this stage in human history are uniquely positioned to see something of that immensity. Uh, of course, Hubble, uh, after whom the space telescope is named, uh, was, was one of the first to really capture just the, the scale of the universe. Forget about its complexity and its dynamism, just the immensity in terms of size of the universe. And I think this is one of those kind of hermeneutical opportunities to think about or reread and rethink the sources in dialogue with contemporary science or knowledge in the broader sense of the term. And I think this is an opportunity for us to reimagine or think about Augustine in a new way. So I'm going to read a little bit. This is uh, uh, coming from Augustine, and, and this is a treatment of some of the key sources uh, that Augustine talks about uh, in terms of uh, the divine and the way in which it is reflected in the natural world. Augustine's understanding of creation in sapientia leads him to conclude that creation will reflect and testify to the creator. The beauty instantiated in individual creatures reflects God's art, the ars divina, through which he speaks to the soul and summons it to be mindful of its origin. This is the sense in which Augustine is said to speak of the created world as that which addresses the rational agent. Precisely what does the world signify? What does it say to us and how? For Augustine, one of the specific things the world speaks is praise, confessio, 
the beauty or pulcritudo of nature constitutes its confession to God. If we are attentive to nature, it tells us that God made it. The admiration of created things always serves a referential function insofar as when we consider natural realities, we are led to knowledge of their creator, which must then develop into praise. Crucially for Augustine, when we express this, inanimate creation praises God in our voice. As Augustine states, how do those things cry out? In other words, how do natural realities cry out to God? When they are considered and God is found or discovered, they cry out from our consideration. They cry out from our voice. Created in divine wisdom, nature therefore becomes a locus of contact between God and the soul, between human and divine. It is intelligible. It is capable of speaking to the rational agent. We see a brief treatment of this in two of Augustine's enerationes, two of his treatments of the Psalms, in particular the Psalm according to which the heavens declare the glory of God. Here, Augustine links his exegesis of the Psalm's approach to the speech of the natural world with his theology of creation in Sapientia as reflected in the Johannine prologue. When the heavens declare God's glory, Augustine claims, it is especially a declaration of one's nothingness and one's utter dependency on God. The heavens serve to remind us that God is the creator and not we. In Sermo 241, Augustine also describes how the vestiges of God speak to the rational mind. Augustine instructs his listeners to interrogate the beauty of nature in search of knowledge of the divine. Augustine states, interrogate the beauty of the earth, interrogate the beauty of the sea, the beauty of the wind which spreads and blows, the beauty of the sky, the order of the stars, the sun which illumines the day by its light, the moon by which by its splendor tempers the darkness of the night which follows, the animals which move in the seas, which roam about land, which fly through the air. Interrogate hidden souls and visible bodies, visible things which are ruled and invisible things which govern. Augustine's protreptic to interrogation in Sermo 241 is consummated in the following crescendo. Interrogate those things. All of them respond to you. Behold, look, we are beautiful. Their beauty, Augustine states, is their confession. Augustine believes in the ontological excess of worldly things, showing forth the beauty of their origin, what William Desmond calls the overdeterminacy of being, the sapiential saturation of material reality in virtue of its origin in God's creativity. Augustine sees nature as replete with intelligible content, which stands in need of being disclosed by directed inquiry. For Augustine, God's voice echoes in the speech of creation. In Book 10 of the Confessiones, Augustine writes of his method for searching for God. This involves an active, directed searching, indeed, an interrogation. Augustine states that he began with the creatures of the exterior world, and he asked or interrogated them, specifically to discover whether any one of them was God. Augustine depicts apparently inanimate natural objects as speaking, responding, and indeed, confessing. This metaphorical and highly imaginative image of nature speaking is portrayed as a dialogue between Augustine's soul and the world, to which he gives some interpretation when he writes, my interrogation is my intention and their beauty is their response. Augustine's act of interrogation is an expression for his directed, focused inquiry into particular realities, guided by a presentiment of their intelligibility. Whilst the response he hears from various natural bodies 
is their spacious, their form, or their beauty, a property which he is able to perceive by means of his intellect. Augustine writes that natural creatures speak to him specifically for the purpose that he may be brought to love of God. And I think that's crucial here for Augustine. I, I'll just comment on this briefly, that in lo locations like Book 10 of the Confessiones, Augustine begins what might be considered an otherwise very abstract treatise by thinking about what is it that I love when I love my God? He doesn't ask, how do I know God first and foremost? He doesn't ask, what is God like? He, he starts from that perspective of love. He says, what do I love when I love my God? Augustine's interrogatio of created reality takes place within himself. Augustine is not talking to himself merely or daydreaming. Rather, he is calling to mind the various images and memories that he has, unifying them, and then inquiring into them further. The intellect's faculty of intention, according to Augustine, aspires to unity, parsimony, synthesis, and simplicity all of which reflect God's own eternity and immutability. It serves as a faculty by means of which one can begin to overcome the disorienting multiplicity of corporeal reality, enabling one to possess a pure and simplex core. Finally, I, I think it's important to note something about the apophatic dimension of Augustine's theology of creation, that yes, God is dialoguing with us in and through the natural world, that's true, but there's also this double-edged sword, as it were. There's this double-edged response that we must continue to seek God in and through the natural world, yes, but always aware of its divine origin. According to Augustine, the beauty of the world's response includes a double aspect. Creation contains some positive, assertive content, in particular in terms of beauty. But there is also an apophatic or negative dimension. This directs Augustine beyond the very realities that he is interrogating and investigating. Augustine states, I interrogated the sea and the depths and the creeping things of living souls, and they responded, we are not your God. Seek above us. As particular natural realities confess, they simultaneously confess their beauty and their lack thereof, or rather their utter dependence upon God for all that they possess and are. We see this especially when Augustine brings his natural investigation to a conclusion by asking creation to say something to him about the God he is seeking. Augustine writes, And I said to all things which stand around the doors of my flesh, tell me something about my God. All exclaimed in a loud voice, he made us. So as I, I come to the end of this second major section of my talk, I, I think a, a, a nice summary and upshot of the talk so far itself is to look at a quotation from Jean-Louis Chrétien, the late French phenomenologist. And this, I think, also prepares the way for the third and final part of my talk. So Augustine speaks of interrogatio, asking, interrogating, uh, a form of directed inquiry, of, of questioning the universe. Augustine understands this as dialogical and, I, I think, to a great extent, reciprocal, as we've already seen. One of the challenges of a theology of creation that, that I, I find and, and other philosophers and theologians have mentioned is that there is a different sense of interrogation which begins to rise with let's say, the scientific revolution and the age of enlightenment. And Jean-Louis Chrétien captures this quite well. So I, I won't read through this entire quotation, but I will comment on a few parts of it, that there's an approach to interrogation uh, which isn't that kind of spontaneous openness that Augustine describes. There's a form of interrogation which is forcing or obligating something to respond to one's questions. This is the kind of um, interrogation one finds in a, a forensic setting, that, that we're, we're questioning someone where we think that they're guilty, and so we're forcing them to confess. There's this very forced, directed sense of inquiry. And what's significant about that is that it doesn't allow for that spontaneity anymore. There's this predetermined conclusion 
And there's this kind of, uh, I, I'm using this out of context, of course, but there's this kind of will to power, this, this uh, force of, of one's own interests, which is, which is coming uh, to be. I, I think it's Francis Bacon who, who talks about putting nature to the rack and forcing it to divulge its secrets. So this is a very different way of thinking about the natural world. And again, we could go uh, down a, a completely different uh, topic on this, but, but I, I think something like this really brings to light the difference between a kind of early Christian approach to the natural world as something um, uh, which has a kind of partnership with us, as opposed to a later approach, which sees it in terms of just um, neutrality as something that can be manipulated and exploited for our purposes, a, a kind of grid that you might find in someone like Descartes, for example. Uh, so Chrétien, I, I think, really um, focuses our attention here. Um, first of all, we're, we're no longer asking questions with the expectation of something unknown, something mysterious, something that um, will surprise us. Our question must, let's say, determine the range of response. We can no longer have a response that goes beyond the boundaries that we impose upon the natural world. And in fact, that comes from a very specific way of understanding ourselves, of understanding nature and creation. And indeed, ultimately, for someone like Francis, that means, essentially, from a theological perspective, a denial of the doctrine of creation itself. So in this third and final part of my talk, I'd like to connect Augustine's theology of the natural world, his theology of creation, with Laudato Si, and contemporary approaches to eco-theology. I had the opportunity to give some workshops on Laudato Si a few years ago, and knowing nothing essentially about eco-theology, I wasn't really sure uh, what to expect. And I recall reading um, Laudato Si for the first time and saying, well, this, this sounds very familiar, uh, not just in terms of a theology of creation, but in terms of Francis' critiques of approaches to the natural world, which come, let's say, from the uh, modern period, from the scientific revolution, the age of enlightenment, a completely different way of thinking about the natural world. And so again, I'm going to read a few things here, but I, I'm going to, I, I, I hope, connect Augustine's theology of creation with contemporary approaches to eco-theology, and that will allow us to, uh, let's say, come to a kind of conclusion or ascending forth that will um, allow us to consider how Augustine might have a place at the table even today uh, in terms of the ecological crisis. In his encyclical Laudato Si, Pope Francis calls for a universal dialogue on ecological challenges in the world today. He draws upon the values of the Judeo-Christian tradition to compose a response to the current ecological crisis. In doing so, he echoes some of the fundamental principles of an Augustinian theology of creation. Furthermore, he argues for greater attention to the underlying causes of environmental degradation, locating these ultimately in the darkness and sin found in human hearts. According to Dan Horan, in Laudato Si, Francis distinguishes between three distinct models of creation, dominion, stewardship, and kinship. The Pope rejects the first of these, the dominion model. God does not give human beings dominion or domination over the world in the sense that we can do with the world as we please. I'm, I'm teaching on this now, in fact, in some of my classes, and, and the example I give is something like house sitting or babysitting, that one is put in charge, but this is more of a, a stewardship model. This, this involves a sense of responsibility, not simply license. The theology of creation of Laudato Si understands the world as a fabric in which all things are interconnected, especially the natural environment on the one hand and human life on the other. Pope Francis sees in his medieval namesake, Francis of Assisi, a model for the integral connection of, quote, concern for nature, justice for the poor, commitment to society, and interior peace. End quotation. Francis of Assisi thought of the earth as sister and mother. He lived and practiced a radical version of an Augustinian theology of creation. Bonaventure attests that Francis of Assisi 
saw himself as deeply united with each and every part of creation. The result is that he felt called to care for creation as a steward or a fellow member of the community of being or of beings. Quoting Patriarch Bartholomew, Francis states that Christians are called, quote, to accept the world as a sacrament of communion, as a way of sharing with God and our neighbors on a global scale. It is Bartholomew's humble conviction that the divine and the human meet in the slightest detail in the seamless garment of God's creation, end quotation. Furthermore, the pontiff envisions a world infused with divine goodness and beauty. Looking to his immediate predecessor, Benedict XVI, Francis calls for a renewed attention to the book of nature in which God speaks to his beloved creatures. Uh, uh, Wilhelmine Otten, a professor at the University of Chicago, who was uh, Professor Hannon's um, advisor, if I'm not mistaken. She was also a host uh, for me. She's written an excellent article which details the, the history of this concept of the book of nature, how it was crucial to early Christianity, and how in the Middle Ages it, it is um, eclipsed, let's say. As Francis writes, rather than a problem to be solved, the world is a joyful mystery to be contemplated with gladness and praise, end quotation. In other words, the world becomes a locus in which one can embrace the beauty of the created world and thereby elevate the mind to God. Francis of Assisi's response to the natural world resulted in praise of its divine source. It is said that he would even invite flowers to praise the Lord. Francis of Assisi, in virtue of his understanding of the world as creation, refuses to reduce it to a mere object. As the Pope writes, Francis of Assisi helps us to see that an integral, and that an integral ecology calls for openness to categories which transcend the language of mathematics and biology and take us to the heart of what it means to be human. Our understanding of the world determines how we interact with it. As Pope Francis writes, quote, if we approach nature and the environment without this openness to awe and wonder, if we no longer speak the language of fraternity and beauty in our relationship with the world, our attitude will be that of masters, consumers, ruthless exploiters, unable to set limits on their immediate needs, end quotation. As human beings, we have the tendency to think of ourselves as masters of the world, not as stewards or brothers and sisters. This leads to an abuse of the world's resources. Francis is critical of what he calls new paradigms and forms of power derived from technology. And of course, this is a very Heideggerian uh, idea, and I defer to Professor Hannon, who has done extensive work on Heidegger and has a, a relatively recent article in which he talks about Heidegger's approach to the, the, the natural world in, in terms of, of a shepherd, that, that we are meant to be shepherds uh, of being. In the early stages of Laudato Si, Francis invokes some of his pontifical predecessors to substantiate his position. For example, he looks to John Paul II as a key source for arguing that our activity in the created world must respect its initial givenness. In Redemptor Hominis 15, John Paul II critiques the focus on the world in terms of what is immediately useful for our own individual purposes. Likewise, Benedict warns against the tendency to think that we have the final authority over what is true about the world or what its uses will be for us. When we conduct ourselves in such a way, we deny the truth of creation and cause destruction both to the natural world and human society. Francis follows the patriarch Bartholomew, according to whom environmental problems are the result of ethical and spiritual problems in human hearts. Unless one addresses this ethical and spiritual darkness, any environmental intervention will only treat symptoms and not the cause itself. Thus, Francis' encyclical indicates the necessity of a philosophical theological voice at the table 
of ecological discussions. It suggests that the particular programs that are meant to mitigate environmental problems are simply ad hoc responses to a systemic challenge that requires a fundamental and comprehensive strategy. Bartholomew reminds us that a sin against the natural world is a sin against ourselves and against God. He calls for a new way of living, which reorients one's focus to God, away from one's own individual and selfish desires. As a way of bringing this talk to a close, uh, I'm going to talk about ways that we might um, appropriate or reappropriate Augustine in a contemporary setting. I'll show you just uh, a minute uh, of this video, which uh, was published in June of this year. Um, and, and it talks about various approaches to eco-theology. So don't worry about getting every detail, but uh, if, if you can follow, what I'd like you to do is think about uh, what, uh, this is Camille Andres, she's a, a journalist, what she says about contemporary approaches to eco-theology and the extent to which they sound like what we've heard already with respect to Augustine. Alors, on se souvient de cette encyclique du pape qui appelait, je cite, à sauvegarder cette maison commune. Mais du coup, il faut faire coller ces textes. On parlait d'Adam et Ève, il faut un nouveau récit, réinterpréter la Bible, faire une nouvelle exégèse, une nouvelle cosmogonie de, de, de tout cet ensemble de textes. Alors, des relectures, il y en a beaucoup. Elles ne sont d'ailleurs pas toutes euh, d'accord entre elles. C'est pour ça qu'on dit qu'il y a des écothéologies et pas une écothéologie. Euh, ce qui est intéressant, c'est qu'elles ont quand même quelques points communs. Euh, le premier point commun, c'est déjà repenser la notion de création. Qu'est-ce que c'est la création Est-ce que cette création, elle n'aurait pas toujours lieu Est-ce qu'elle ne serait pas continue Est-ce qu'elle n'aurait pas lieu en permanence à, à chaque moment de vie, finalement euh, Donc, ça, ça, ça incite à repenser la vie sur Terre, le vivant. Puis l'autre remise en question, c'est le rôle de l'humain dans tout ça. Euh, finalement, si l'humain est plus au-dessus pour dominer, eh ben, il a quelle place Et là, les écothéologies, en recontextualisant, en relisant les textes, elles trouvent euh, finalement un autre rôle pour l'humain. Elles, elles disent qu'il est là finalement comme au centre d'un jardin pour prendre soin de cette création. Et donc ça change tout, parce qu'on est plutôt dans un rôle, comme on dit, d'intendance ou, ou d'alliance avec cette création, et plus de domination. Et donc finalement, l'homme, euh, l'humain en tout cas, se retrouve dans un, un, un vrai rôle de responsabilité. Et ensuite, il y a encore énormément... So what I'd like to do is, is summarize and comment briefly on some of these key developments in eco-theology in the present day. So um, one thing to keep in mind is that, as we've seen, Augustine has this understanding of creation not simply as completed in the past, not simply uh, as given and uh, dispensed with by God, but as an ongoing process that God is continuing to interact with us. That's crucial to contemporary approaches to eco-theology. And as we've seen, that's fundamental already to Augustine. And the, the second point that, that I, I take away from, from Camille Andres has to do with um, dialogue. And, and that's not immediately obvious. So let me say just something very briefly um, about that. The idea here um, is, as, as she suggests, is this new role of responsibility within the natural world, as, as we've seen with Francis, a rejection of this uh, model of dominion or domination. We're getting rid of that model. But as we rethink the tradition, we're looking at um, intendance ou alliance, uh, stewardship, or perhaps, let's say, partnership or kinship, what, what Francis uh, talks about in the encyclical. And I think Augustine is interesting in that respect because, as we've seen, he has this notion of dialoguing with uh, the created world, of, of speaking to it, listening to it, that God's voice is present in it. And I think if we take that seriously and internalize it, what it suggests is a completely different approach to the created world. We cannot genuinely dialogue with someone uh, whom we do not respect. We cannot genuinely interrogate and have a conversation with someone in the Augustinian sense of the term if we are not somehow engaged in a relationship. So I think it's crucial to uh, look at Augustine uh, as a source for contemporary eco-theology as well. As we've seen from Francis, the current ecological crisis includes an essentially theological element. It, you could think of it in terms of a denial of the truth of creation itself. As Francis argues and others have argued, a theological response is required for any significant change in terms of the uh, environmental challenges 
that we face as a global community. What I'd like to suggest is that we need an Augustinian voice at the table of eco-theology, especially a source that can help us to think about creatio continua, that God is still present in and, and creating the world at every moment, and that we can also engage in dialogue with this world and come to learn something about God and about ourselves precisely in and through the natural world. So I, I thank you very much for your kind attention. I, I look forward very much to what Professor Hannon uh, has to say and any questions or comments that you would be willing to share. So again, thank you so much uh, for joining and I look forward to the rest of this program. Thank you, Dr. Knott. So now we shall proceed to uh, a brief response by our guest uh, discussant, whom I will introduce right away as he prepares his own slides. Our discussant uh, responding to Dr. Knott's uh, presentation is Dr. Sean Hannon. He is an associate professor in the humanities department at McEwan University in Edmonton, Alberta, Canada. He is the author of On Time, Change, History, and Conversion, published with Bloomsbury in 2020. And with W. Ezekiel Goga, his second book is Mysticism and Materialism in the Wake of German Idealism, forthcoming with Rutledge. He has also written articles published in Agustinian Studies, Political Theology, and the Journal of Early Christian Studies. Most recently, he has overseen the publication of an edited volume simply called Augustine and Time with Rowan and Littlefield. Uh, with no further ado, uh, Professor Hannon, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, may I quickly ask uh, Dr. Knotts perhaps to give me a thumbs up if I'm coming through clearly? on video and audio? Okay, thank you. I will now go full screen and give my response. Oops. So I'd like to begin uh, by thanking Dr. Irisar uh, for giving me a chance to respond to Dr. Knotts's uh, evocative presentation, as well as to his book, which looms large in the background. Uh, and I confess that I prepared my response in large part by going back through the book, uh, as well as through my own uh, book review, which I wrote on this book. So I've been really marinating uh, in the content of the monograph itself. Now, near the end of his book's conclusion, Knotts invites readers to, quote, see the world not as a realm evacuated of meaning and inertly awaiting our investigative efforts, but as the repository of truths to be uncovered and understood. Now, when I read those words, I am reminded of a passage from, of all things, and maybe this is a bizarre comparison, uh, Mary Shelley's Frankenstein. Its context finds Victor reminiscing to Walton about the youthful conversations on art and science he had once enjoyed with his adopted sister and eventual bride, Elizabeth. Quoting now from page 21 of the Oxford edition, this is the older Oxford edition by Marilyn Butler, which I'll hold up here, uh, not the new version by Nick Groom, page 21. Quoting Victor now, I delighted in investigating the facts relative to the actual world. She busied herself in following the aerial creations of the poets. The world was to me a secret, which I, I desired to discover. To her, it was a vacancy which she sought to people with imaginations of her own. Yet Shelley's words may not map perfectly onto those written by Dr. Knotts. Shelley opposes investigation uh, with the notion of a vacant world, right? She opposes those two against each other, while Knotts opposes investigation uh, into meaningless nature to the idea of a repository of truths. So I don't mean to suggest that somehow Shelley is saying exactly the same thing, but there is a kind of recurring use of terminology there that I think might be interesting to unpack. Now for Knotts, this shift in the direction of seeing the world as a repository of truths has to counteract the powers of disenchantment that currently threaten to reduce our environment to little more than a sum of calculable data. But does that mean we need to attempt some sort of possibly romantic re-enchantment? That's not immediately clear. 
Rather than turning to the romantics, Knotts tends to approach the problem hermeneutically. His guide is Gadamer, not Shelley. It then becomes a question of how we are to interpret the world rather than sum it up or calculate its parts. But you might be wondering, how does all this relate to Augustine of Hippo? For Knotts, Augustine offers us a way of looking at the world as something that arrives before us as already interpretable. The world, in other words, operates somewhat like a text. Augustine suggests as much in works like De, Doctor, excuse me, De Doctrina Christiana, which expands the logic of the sign to encompass the totality of the created universe with all things, or at least apparent things, turning out to be signs, ultimately signifying one shared referent, namely God. Echoes of this idea, as uh, Dr. Knotts anticipated, Dr. Knotts anticipated the vast majority of points uh, that I'm going to be raising and questions I'm going to be raising, so kudos on that count. But echoes of this idea could be heard in medieval rhetoric surrounding the Book of Nature. Might a 12th century text like Elan of Lille's Plaint of Nature serve as a resource for our own attempts to rethink our, our relationship to the natural world in the 21st century? In Elan's text, nature speaks. Of course, as Knotts points out in his book, by way of a subtle engagement with the ideas of Jean-Louis Chrétien, nature already spoke to Augustine in his confessions. Nature, we learn, always speaks first. The human task is then to figure out how to respond. Ultimately, what Knotts finds in the Augustinian tradition is an invitation to, if I can coin a phrase, think nature hermeneutically. The way forward lies in the application of, to borrow from Knotts's words, the application of hermeneutical methods to the text analog of nature. The goal then is not to engage in a quasi-romantic re-enchantment of the natural environment. To quote from Knotts again, I am not advocating a simple return to the past or a re-enchantment, but rather a critical appraisal of the foregoing dispensation. As today's presentation has shown, Knotts's project is not a backwards looking fetishization of antiquity or of the Middle Ages. Instead, it is a forward thinking call to reinterpret our relationship with nature, perhaps not so different from Pope Francis's call for us to serve as stewards of creation in Laudato Si. Now, in my remarks uh, that I've made so far, essentially a re-presentation of, of Knott's own work, um, I've tried to weave in some questions um, sort of organically as I, as I give you my reaction to, uh, uh, to, to Knott's arguments. But I would like to re recapitulate them here, break them down into five discrete questions or groups of questions. And then again, because Dr. Knott's anticipated, uh, some of my questions already, I might toss in two more that I didn't put in the PowerPoint, but that I thought of while listening to the presentation today. So what in the final analysis, and this is question number one, what in the final analysis should we say about the romantics of Shelley's era? Can we find something of value in their critique of disenchantment, even as we refuse to engage in a kind of re-enchantment? Or were they just barking up the wrong tree? Relatedly, having heeded Knotts's advice, and with Shelley now on our minds, should we go back out into the world as neo-victors or neo-Elizabeths? Uh, do we have to decide between these two poles uh, that Shelley set out for us? In other words, how are we to square the naturalistic and poetic worldviews Shelley sought to capture through these characters and their conversations? Number three, what about those medieval authors who wrote of a book of nature. This was something that uh, Dr. Knotts discussed. We can maybe nuance this a bit to talk about whether the book of nature is, is a creation of late antiquity, uh, whether the Middle Ages is already overcoming this language. I'd be interested in hearing more about that as well. Um, but just saying for now, for the sake of the question that we want to associate the book of nature idea with the Middle Ages, uh, what can we do with, with texts from that period that seem to, to speak in this way? Can these sorts of writings still serve as resources for us to think with? 
right? Kind of like my question with the Romantics, but now thinking more with uh, figures from the 12th century Renaissance. And of course, Dr. Knotts headed me off at the past with this one as well, uh, but I'm inspired to act, ask this uh, in part due to uh, the work of Dr. Wilhelmine Otten, uh, my own former doctoral advisor. And in addition to her article in the Book of Nature, I would also point us in the direction of her recent monograph, Thinking Nature and the Nature of Thinking from Ari Eugenia to Emerson, uh, which kind of takes us back, not just to the 12th century Renaissance, but even further back to the Carolingian Renaissance of the early Middle Ages, and then tries to bring the discussion about nature forward into the modern era, hooking up with figures from the 19th century, uh, not just romantics, but also uh, American transcendentalists. Number four, do we need something like an ontology to go along with our hermeneutics here? And we can also argue whether ontology is the right word or not. Um, in other words, does our engagement with nature have to arrive at some kind of new account of the things found in nature? Or must we instead stay within the proper confines of the circulation of signs? Or, another option, is Gadamer instead teaching us to overcome the very distinction between ontology and hermeneutics posed in this sort of clumsy uh, dichotomy? And then number five, finally, how are we to move from the theoretical clarification of our hermeneutical relationship with nature? And I think there's no doubt that um, Dr. Knotts's book does an excellent job uh, in that department, but how are we to move from the theoretical clarification of our hermeneutical relationship with nature to a series of practical steps that ought to be taken on the basis of that relationship? Should we simply follow Laudato Si to the letter or, or just simply be inspired by its account of stewardship? Uh, or are there any further steps that must be taken, perhaps concrete actions um, that would flow out from this new way of engaging with nature hermeneutically. So those are the five questions or groups of questions I came up with previously. I'd like to add two more if I can, and then Dr. Knotts can maybe cut out the ones that he feels he's already addressed and focus on other ones. It's really just, you know, it's up to you if you wanna take or leave any of these. But here are two that I thought of while, while listening to your presentation. Um, one, relates kind of to my question about the 12th century Renaissance and ideas of the book of nature, but moves one century later into the 13th century, the era of the mendicants and the scholastics, and uh, joins up with what you discussed as Pope Francis's use of Francis of Assisi. So I think you spoke beautifully already about the idea of um, Francis of Assisi uh, approaching nature through things like the, you know, uh, his canticles and so on. Um, but I just wanted to kind of invite you, if you had anything else to say also about Francis's uh, and later Franciscan's special relationship to sites like uh, the top of Monte Pena, where, he, you know, where he's supposed to have this vision of the crucified uh, seraph that gives him the stigmata. And then later you have figures like Bonaventure ascending the same mountain in order to have a kind of intellectual ascent. Um, and what's interesting about that is that even though obviously you're getting a kind of valuation of the intellectual as higher than, than the sensory realm, right? Intellectual ascent beats sensory ascent. Still the sensory ascent, it seems to be playing a crucial role, right? It's almost like you need to engage, you need to have that experience on the outer mountain, the external mountain, if you actually then want to have an experience of the internal mountain, right? If we can use that phrase for someone like Bonaventure. And that I think you could also connect to Augustine, things that Augustine says about, you know, people will climb all these mountains to see beautiful sights, but they forget to look within their own selves. Petrarch's gonna pick up on that too. So it just seems like there's a whole nest of, of connected themes there. And I'd be curious how those themes fit into your, your approach here. And the other one is kind of maybe much more specific and, and boring in a way. So I immediately regret ending with it, but um, you talked a little bit about the phrase, my interrogation was my intensio. And uh, intensio I have found has been one of the more difficult words to translate sometimes in Augustine, right? I, I'm perfectly fine to leave it as intention because then it just 
kind of passes the buck and lets other people <laughs> try to figure out what an intention is. But I guess I'm curious in, in passages like that, what do you think intentio means, right? Is it a kind of cognitive directedness or is that me bringing in Husserl and other phenom phenomenological accounts of intentionality? Is it more willful or almost voluntaristic, right? Is it that kind of intendedness? Um, is it a mix of intellectual and voluntaristic? I don't know. I'm just curious what, what you think about that. So I think I've taken up uh, enough of everyone's time here. So I'll end with, uh, oops, oh, oh no. uh, with my final slide and say thank you again, uh, both to Dr. Knotts and Dr. Risar, and also just want to shamelessly plug uh, that next, books, next book of mine uh, that Dr. Risar mentioned. And I will put a link to the book in the chat in case anyone's interested. Uh, in learning more about it. So thank you again for letting me to, letting me participate in this. This was great. I look forward to uh, to the discussion. Wonderful. Uh, thank you, Professor Hannan. And again, congratulations on your on your book. So now we will return briefly to you, uh, Dr. Knotts. Uh, maybe you can take five minutes to to address uh, whatever you you gravitate most towards based on what. Uh, the feedback was, and then we'll open the floor um, for the final part of our of our event, where you know the audience can jump in and ask questions. Wonderful. Well, first of all, Professor Hannon, thank you so much. Uh, I know you've read the book, and and it's clear that you've taken the time not just to read it, but really to engage with it. And so, um, I, I, I sincerely, I'm really grateful and, and appreciative of, of that. That 